joining us on another Farminard. I'm, I'm Luke Grand, staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa. We're really glad to have you here in our fourth of five fall Farminars in the 2013 series. Uh, please join us again next week for a new Farminar, the final of the fall series on uh, building relationships and building customers. Two horticulture farms talk about how they use relationship building techniques to build their markets. And rather than looking at uh, a marketing plan in kind of a calculated uh, uh, fashion uh, like that, they, they look at it more as serving uh, their, their relationships, uh, their, their, their uh, community. So that's a great uh, topic to consider for selling some meat, potentially, to your community. These are a free service. Practical Farms of Iowa um, provides these free of, of no cost to participate. And uh, we do pay our farmers for sharing their knowledge. So uh, we're just really glad to, you could be involved in this online seminar. Uh, just a little bit about Practical Farmers. Um, I see many, many members in the crowd tonight. I really am glad to see you all here. And just kind of wanted to share for folks maybe who aren't members of Practical Farmers uh, what we value as members. We're a 2,200 member organization that's been around for about 28 years. And uh, we've got all kinds of farms, all kinds of scales, all kinds of markets, uh, enterprises, production practices, you name it, we've got it. Uh, what brings all of us together? And I think uh, our, our organization has really been clear with these values that we, we care so much about, as you can see on the screen here. Diversity and independence is very important, um, because we feel that, that those, uh, those two words and farms definitely enhance Earth's ecosystems when they're diversified and independent. We value an agriculture that's built on a fair market system with widespread ownership of land and resources. So important for us to always find ways to increase the diversity of who owns the land. We value a commitment to family, community, and a celebration of wholesome food. Those values have really held us together through 28 years of, uh, of as a nonprofit organization. We started in a kitchen on the kitchen table of Dick and Sharon Thompson's house, uh, their farmhouse near Boone. Here's a photo of Sharon and Dick Thompson there with uh, co-founder Larry Callum. Uh, Dick Thompson was such a great inspiration to all of us, and uh, just recently passed away. And we're really very grateful for him uh, for starting this wonderful network of farmers. We believe in growing more than crops. That really sums it up. That's one of our members' uh, sayings that they came up with. Uh, actually, Dick, Dick Thompson said that. He said, we don't grow crops. We, just, we grow people. So uh, I'm really glad to be part of, uh, part of this organization and glad to have you here uh, with us tonight so we can, we can all learn more together. We have all kinds of farmers. I think Jeff Hafner uh, sums up the diversity in one farm as one example of how diverse our members are, you know, from uh, at the Hafner farm, they grow a little of everything. They have uh, crops and livestock, and they have, uh, they have forages that they grow. They have sell some honey, and they even have a fish farm, a hydroponic uh, greenhouse operation. They converted an old CAFO into a, a fish uh, tilapia production and, and hydroponic greenhouse. If you're not a member, please join. There's no better way to stay in touch with a bunch of different great farmers than be a member of Practical Farmers. You get a great quarterly newsletter. Uh, discounts to our annual conference that are very sizable. You could save $100 as a PFI member uh, to come to our annual conference in January. Join online. We have some events coming up. Looks, looks like the photo didn't show up, but uh, just a quick uh, uh, summary. Uh, you can click on that hyperlink and go to our monthly calendar that uh, summarizes all the different events that might be pertinent to you in your life. Check out that event calendar on our website. This week, we've got our uh, cooperators meeting, which is one of our uh, finest events of the year, where we bring together uh, hundreds uh, of farm, uh, a little over 100 of farmers uh, who want to do research on their farms. And then next week, we've got this great opportunity for folks that are looking towards uh, CSA marketing. You can learn from three different uh, CSA farms, community-supported agriculture farms, um, at, uh, at, a, at an overnight event near Montour, Iowa. Free for Practical Farmers of Iowa members, another great benefit of many of our events are reduced or free for our members. I mentioned our annual conference a little earlier. That's an opportunity uh, to mark your calendars and attend a wonderful conference uh, January 24th and 25th in, uh, in Ames, Iowa at the Sheeman Building. You can register online. And you can save actually save a lot of money if you register early. So be sure to get in your registration before the mid-January uh, mid date there on the screen, January 15th. And uh, I, I'm sure Ryan will point this out as well, but um, there's a pre-conference short course. There's two options for the short course. Um, one of them is on holistic management. And you can learn from farmers like Irene Franzen on the screen here, 
whose whose farm has used holistic management to guide their decision making throughout the many decades that their family has been farming. And uh, Ann Adams from the Holistic Management International from uh, I think New Mexico. She's she's making the trip to Iowa to help lead this course as an introduction to the triple bottom line with holistic management. That's a pre-conference short course for 50 bucks. You can sign up for that and get a great uh, half day on Thursday and a half day on Friday, addition to your learning. Finally, if there's an opportunity, if you're looking to hire a beginning farmer, uh, excuse me, if you're looking to hire someone on your farm this year and you would like to get a really good employee who wants to learn everything they can about the business, you can apply to be a PFI trainer and we'll pay you up to a thousand bucks a year to train that beginning farmer, uh, kind of give them more than you would just a typical wage earning employee, uh, like uh, answer questions they have about financing, how the farm makes a profit, how it markets its crops. Share your farm knowledge. It's a great opportunity to uh, be a PFI trainer. The way it works is you fill out this application online and apply, and your peers, farmers in our organization, your fellow members, will, uh, will rank applications and select up to 15 highly qualified trainer farms to feature this year and uh, will help promote your job opportunity. Finally, here we go. Let's talk uh, with Ryan Herman and the Valemas from uh, Northwest Iowa. And uh, we will reserve 30 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Uh, so the first part of the farminar will be focused on answering Laura and Neil's priorities to their questions. I'll pull up their slideshow, and you can begin. Okay, thanks, Luke. Um, I guess uh, you know Luke asked me to do this, and and I had done one of these a couple of years ago, and and so it's it's kind of related to the the farminar I did a couple of years ago, and so I'm kind of working off of that as as a little bit of a base, and I asked Luke to you know maybe provide a link to that older one. That's going to go a little bit more in depth into the record keeping that. I try to do. I, I uh, like anybody else. I sometimes get bogged down in paperwork or just plain uh, don't do it, or would rather be outside moving cattle. So uh, I think that's pretty common, though. Um, and and I and I think last time when I did one too, I I had quite a bit of information in it, and I don't know if we quite got through it all. And this one's pretty similar. I I have a lot of slides here, and we may not get through it all. But I had the thought that you know if if um, if it's up on PFI's website, you know people could come back again and and access it and and look at the information. And that's the reason why on some of these slides I wrote out word for word rather than you know kind of bullet points um, to try to help explain things. And like I said in the chat box too, anybody. Please feel free to email me uh, at any time when this is over. If you have questions or something I didn't uh, get to or didn't get a chance to answer any questions, so thanks everybody for tuning in. I I hope you enjoy this. Um, Luke, am I right that I just pushed the down arrow to go through the slides myself, or do I need you to forward them? That's right. Uh, follow the green arrow on your screen there and click that. Uh that right arrow to advance the slides. OK, very good. Thank you. OK, so a little bit of background for anybody that doesn't know me. Um, we started out with a cow-calf herd um, probably, well, we've had one forever. But uh, about 12 years ago, I came back to the home farm. and. It was about that time that the uh, first ethanol mandate came out, and we kind of stood back and said, "Whoa, you know, what's what's going on here? Um, you know, government policy is really dictating, you know, how we run our farm more and more." And so, at that time, we we had the cow calf, and we had a feedlot, and we decided to start phasing out the feedlot and pull a few animals off of there and, and on the grass. And uh, that went well. And so we uh, we completely phased out the feedlot. And as things have progressed here, we've worked on our home farm for about 10 years, uh, improving the pastures. And now it's of enough quality that um, we've found a different farm for the cows and calves to go on to. And we just 
bring our uh, yearlings back onto the home farm as well as take on some custom grazed cattle um, during during the green season anyway. Um, we've developed a hundred paddocks on there and move the cattle at least once a day. We've experimented with with up to seven or eight times a day. Um, uh, about a year ago, we also got uh, purchased a, a hair sheep flock. Uh, they run uh, with the yearlings when the yearlings are there at, on Dad's home farm, and we try to move them once a week. Is kind of how we set up their paddocks this summer. That's still definitely a work in progress. Um, the cow calf herd is primarily black and red Angus. We try to go with um, uh, grass type genetics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's probably why there's a few people in the audience that that, that took the class with us uh, in Decora. I know Aaron Wilson was one of them. Um, we took a class, we brought in Terry Gompert, and he taught us all holistic management. Most of us hadn't been familiar with that. Um, that was, boy, six, seven years ago now. And uh, I really believe in that, and that'll kind of be a repeating theme in this farm and ours, the use of holistic management. And, um, you know, some people don't believe in it. It's, it's not a, you know, strict prescription for grazing a certain way. I think it offers a person a lot more flexibility and a way to think through the whole grazing process and all of your options. Uh, we use that quite a bit. And our grasses in northeast Iowa are primarily orchard grass, uh, some alfalfa left over from when the pastures were fields, and uh, some red clover. I'll turn it over to Neil and Laura. Okay. Well, Laura's sitting right next to me here. and. I'll do the most talking, though, I suppose. Um, we live uh, in Harris, Iowa, so it's a very small town. Uh, my parents have a 200-cow dairy farm that's right on the edge of town, which kind of presents its own problems sometimes. Um, at this point, well, in January 1 of this past year, we started the process with my parents to figure out how we can do a farm transition or at least start the process and we've now been working on it for almost a full year and still we haven't signed any papers but it's it's such a complicated process that we're progressing slowly so we're, our plan right at this point is to purchase a percent of the cows each year um, I have a younger brother who's interested in farming so we're thinking by the time he graduates high school he'll have a better idea of what he would like to do and so our thought has been that we purchase seven percent of the dairy cows and replacement heifers for the next seven years so that we're up to fifty percent of the herd I know my parents I think by the time they're 62 they want to have more hands-off role and I we're excited about it and to increase our income and our family at the same time it's I think it'll be a good way to do it but we have a concern for the lifestyle of dairy farming especially if we decide to decrease the size of the herd, our lifestyle would definitely change. I would be more stuck in the barn, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. I think we could make a good living doing it, but it's a concern for us at this point. Um, <clears throat> aside from working on the farm, which at this point I'm basically an employee of the farm. I have been since I graduated college, and, and that's been... Uh, three and a half years now. So at the same time, soon after I graduated college, I decided to start grazing some animals. Uh, my parents have a farm. I, I believe you'll see the picture of it on a slide later. Um, they have 200 acres up right on the Minnesota border at Iowa Lake. Um, beautiful piece of ground, uh, rolling hills, and there was some areas there that they weren't able to farm with machinery, and so we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to come in and start grazing those areas and so we've been gradually fencing in more of the areas and it takes a lot of time but that's kind of what we've been up to for the last three years uh, the first two years we grazed 
uh, some steers that my parents had. And then this past year, we started grazing some heifers. Uh, the first year we grazed, it's not a big number. We grazed six the first year, 10 the second year, and this year we're gra we grazed 15. Uh, this Osceola County is the county we live in, and it's a major area for row crops. There are There's more animals in this county than there were maybe a number of years ago, but still it's a very flat area, and rents at this point are going for more than $200 an acre. And uh, I think we'll talk about that later a little bit. And so I guess one of the questions that we're working on is, how do we find an enterprise that cash flows and fits our lifestyle and personal goals? Because part of the thing about dairy farming to us is we think it can be very profitable, but the lifestyle might take a hit. And I enjoy grazing animals on grass a lot, but so far it hasn't been economic, uh, very economical. We've made money doing it, but not a lot. Uh, we have one young son. He's... Uh, do, he's just about two years old, and we have a second child due soon. We actually moved up the farm in our, I think, because my wife's due in about two weeks, and we wanted to get it over with. <laughs> so I guess that's maybe a basic idea of what who we are. Do you okay. want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Neil. Okay, so like I said last year, we custom grazed some dairy heifers. Um, it was we actually got the idea from Greg Judy. Yeah, Greg Judy last year at the at the PFI conference, and he inspired us to do custom grazing, which worked out very well for us. And it was very encouraging this year because instead of hoping that at the end of the year we can sell them and make a profit, we Every month got a certain amount that we figured that uh, an agreement we came up with my parents, and so they would pay us basically a certain amount per month to basically raise the grass, raise the heifers, and take care of them. Uh, this year we um, increased our pasture size by about four acres. I'd say it was about five acres to begin with, so it was maybe nine acres. We're not exactly sure because it's kind of an odd area, but I would say about nine acres at this point. Um, we far, well, we fenced in the four acres, which is actually a pretty steep hill that had alfalfa on it, and we were concerned about bloating, so we kind of pushed into it slowly. So we had a patch of grass next to this alfalfa, and every day we would give them a bit more alfalfa until they grazed that whole section and then we moved them on. So part of our question is, can this work on $200 rented ground? We have the ability to increase the ground that we're grazing. My parents are pretty happy for us to do what we'd like and they're open to different ideas of gradually grazing more. And part of the question we also have is, as we're increasing the size of the dairy herd, we're also talking about increasing the size of our grazing herd, and those two might come into a bit of conflict with each other. There's, I guess there's only so much time in a day. So that's, that's good for this slide, I suppose. Um, the picture here is actually of steers that we grazed two years ago. I think I got better pictures that year than this past year, but um, our setup is very simple. Um, the first year, after reading one of Joel Salatin's books, his book You Can Farm, uh, I wanted to try out some of the radical ideas, so one of the things I did was to try and make my fencing easy. I put up one strand of high tensile wire, electric wire, and we had one mishap, but <laughs> for the rest of the year, it actually worked out pretty nicely. But it, I I increased it to two strands this year because it, it was I was too stressed about it, and it was I I was happy that we tried it, but I'm much happier having two strands, and eventually three or more would be <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> uh, here's a picture 
Um, the land we're grazing is right on the south side of Iowa Lake. So the lake straddles the Iowa-Minnesota border. Half of it's in Iowa. So we're right on the Iowa side. And I'm grazing around the southern part of the lake. Um, you can see there's quite a distance between our pasture and the lake. It's kind of lower ground that we're grazing. And um, the reason I had it this amount of distance from the lake was because once you get closer, you can't really tell from the picture, but it's more reedy type grass and definitely a wetter area. So we decided to give ourselves a little more space from the lake. And it, we also didn't want to step on anybody's toes when it came to not being ecologically sound with the lake. So we kind of gave ourselves some space. And we also, I think we have some wildlife habitat that we sort of kept there. Okay. Um, I guess the title for this farm and um, you know, really wants us to get into, you know, budgets for different enterprises and trying to think my way, you know, through this as I prepared for this, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, you know, I've talked with um, Denise Schwab at Iowa State Extension and I was part of, uh, I think, PFI um, was also part of it. You know, we a few years back we did a big analysis on, you know, grass-fed beef farms. You know, I know some of the people listening were involved in that too. And, um, you know, first of all, just to get all the numbers together and, and go through it for one to three years was was daunting enough. But, you know, one thing we learned is, and that's my fourth bullet point there, you know, whether it's, you know, specific for grass-fed beef or it's any spa analysis that they do for any beef herd, it, it really varies widely. So I found a lot of difficulty in, in trying to put things, you know, put specific numbers together for this. And, and I hope everybody listening, you know, isn't, isn't too dissatisfied with me for not, for being a bit vague. Um, but, but it really is, you know, hard to, to, you know, pinpoint, you know, certain you're going to make so many dollars per head on, on raising this. Um, and, and that's why I really wanted to, to link my previous farm and I mean, that's the best thing you can do is, is do your own records and, and, uh, and experiment a little, come up, you know, do just what Neil is doing and, and Laura's doing, uh, experiment a little bit, keep good records, and, and see how it goes for you. But the, the information I do have um, in the summer, running running the yearlings, you know, they'll vary from 500 to 900 pounds depending on how well mine over winter and what the custom, gra custom uh, grazer cattle's owner sends me. Um, it'll run anywhere from 30 to 50 30 cents, it should be 50 cents, 30 cents to 50 cents um, per pound of gain. Um, that That's including um, all my variable expenses and um, and I believe I've allocated something for fist, fixed expenses too. Um, and then as far as the cow herd, um, you know, Luke had or I'm sorry, uh, Neil had a question for me, which we'll probably get to later. You know, what can you ex expect to make with a beef cow each year? Well, you know, that's that's really tough too. Um, throughout the U.S., you know, anywhere from $350 to $800 is what it seems like it's costing to carry a beef cow um, for a full year. And so you can kind of just extrapolate, you know, what are you going to wean the calf? What's the weight going to be? And what kind of price, you know, what, what is the market going to be at at that time? And, and um, you know, some people are probably in the positive and And I know there's, you know, a great many people that are that are in the negative. And, and one of the reasons is the current hay cost. And another reason is... Uh, 
is land and and probably another major reason is is just uh, not enough animals per per full-time person working and I'll get into that too a little bit later um, the sheep are a little bit new to me yet um, but it seemed like last year with a fairly you know pretty hard year as far as hay feeding and just getting used to the sheep and making plenty of mistakes that it took you know between hay cost and um, and pasture cost and all the other expenses that it was around fifty dollars to carry a ewe and lambs um, for that year you know hopefully lambs plural but in most cases my first year here it was just a single um, and then and that was not a finished lamb, just a 70 pounder that I sold um, here a few weeks ago. So it wasn't even December, and um, and they sold for for over fifty dollars. So that means a positive margin, and and uh, I guess I'm happy with that for the first year. But the profitability on on sheep, you know, really looks pretty decent, and um, you know, goats, chickens, other other livestock. I don't have a lot of experience with. You know, pretty much from what I've heard from people is basically the smaller the the animal, the more profit potential you have. That's the difficult thing with with beef cattle, um, at least when you're talking um, meat type animals. Uh, dairy, I'll I guess I'll fall back on Neil and Laura on that. I I think that's a whole different. Uh, whole different thing when when it's a milk producing animal um, but you know they give and take um, there can be a lot more work to involved with those smaller animals I know a lot of you um, by the pole um, raise poultry and and you you folks know just how much work that can be how hands-on it it can be All right, so just briefly, and, and this is probably old news to most of you um, on the marketing end, just you know some, some enterprise options. Um, now, Neil had mentioned to me, I had asked him a question at some point when we were emailing back and forth getting ready for this, if, if he was interested at all in direct marketing, because that can be another avenue to increase you know, profits a little bit. It, it's a whole nother business, the marketing end of it. But it, it might be, a, you know, basically another enterprise that would help uh, pad the bottom line. And um, and he kind of leaned toward no, um, because he does have some other very good options um, ahead of him. Um, so I threw in here. There's. Uh, a lot of information about wholesaling, uh, different kinds of animals, and different options. Um, you know, you can sell sell a whole animal to many of these grass-fed beef buyers. Um, if you're not selling a completely grass-finished animal, talk to those same people, and a lot of times they'll have people out there that will uh, specialize. In, uh, in just the finishing end because really that's where all the premium is or not all of it but a lot of it is in that very end um, last few hundred pounds on the beef um, uh, also you can uh, seasonal custom graze I do a bit of that too I'll mention Neil Dennis is a good example and he's one of the speakers at the the conference coming up. I've been following him for quite a few years and adopted a lot of the things he does, especially uh, all the time-saving devices that he's developed. And uh, as far as scaling up, um, I think that you know that can really help a person. And and uh, uh, if you're interested in that, I would highly recommend listening to to his couple of talks at the conference. Um, Lamb, I'm just learning a little bit about. There's uh, several wholesalers you can uh, sell into. Uh, a couple of guys that direct market that I, you know, they're a little more more well known. Cody Holmes in Missouri and Kevin Fulton in Nebraska. 
pork. There's uh, Neiman Ranch. I know some of you. Uh, some of you uh, earlier, anyway. There were several of you that uh, raised pasture pork, and you're probably aware of Neiman Ranch. And of course, direct marketing again. Chicken. Uh, Joel Solitan was was mentioned, and uh, that's that's an excellent product for uh, foot in the door type of marketing. You know, get a get a start with a customer base. Uh, nothing sells better than chicken and ground uh, ground beef right now, just because of its price point. Uh, vegetable, fruit, and nut production. Uh, these are great things that can be integrated uh, into a livestock farm as well as cash cropping. Um, Mark Shepard and Gabe, Gabe Brown are both going to be speaking at the PFI conference. Um, I'll probably mention this a little bit later too, Neil, but on you know $200 an acre and up ground, you know, integrating crops, you know, whether it's organic or conventional, similar to Gabe Brown, that just may, you know, it may have to be uh, part of the part of the whole equation. Okay, so just uh, just grass farming in general, uh, the the main points, the main things that I believe in, uh, stocking rate per acre. Um, a lot of the the uh, good consultants I've talked with, they they kind of say, don't even worry about genetics until you're stocked fully. And what what stocked fully is um, can mean different things to different people. Um, a meeting I went to this this summer in Nebraska, a gentleman from uh, I believe Zimbabwe, Johann Zeitzman. He uh, he got half of his ranch taken away from him by the government, and he didn't really know what to do. Uh, cow price was in the tank again because of the government, and so on half the land he began basically mob grazing. He calls it ultra high stock density grazing, and he believes he's the one that pioneered that uh, quite a few years ago. And so, you know, what what is a what is a heavy stocking rate? What can the land really produce? Um, you know, that's that's up to everybody to find for themselves. Um, how much the land is going to produce is is very dependent on the recovery period of the forage. Um, the number one mistake I make year in and year out. Um, on certain pastures, you know, is is not monitoring the recovery period as I should. Um, that'll that'll catch up with a person. Uh, I mentioned cost of gain a little bit earlier on on different grazing animals or cost to carry on a animal you're keeping year round, like a beef cow. Um, having the numbers at your fingertips so that you can make good decisions is important. Neil mentioned that he has very little infrastructure. I like that a lot. The really the hardest part about this this whole business is keeping things simple. I mentioned smaller livestock, uh, working with nature, um, even possibly going toward more seasonal production. Um, you know, as hay prices are are going up here, um, you know, it really has me wondering if I should. Be scaling back the uh, my my cow herd. Um, you know, I do all that I can to extend the grazing season, but at times you're limited. Even if you have you know great grazing genetics that are going into winter with a good body condition, you know, there's only so much you can do when you get a ice storm and then a snowstorm and then an ice storm and another snowstorm. So they they just uh, can't graze through it in some cases. Um, that's what I really like about uh, the seasonal custom grazing. You get cash flow every month. I don't have a note at the bank for those animals, and um, and you can send them home. You know whether it's a drought or 
or if it's uh you know winter coming on or whatever you can you can send them back to their owner and and uh, I did that uh, I was a little, have to admit I was a little too busy putting in fence for for sheep and finishing up my hundred paddock project on Dad's farm and uh, I kind of dropped the ball on July and August when when um, we didn't get much rain and it caught up to, with me well what I had to do was I I sold uh, my own yearlings and I sent the the custom grazing yearlings uh, off in early September well, luckily then we uh, got a little bit of rain and and got a nice bump in, in fall forage growth and and I'm still out there grazing the sheep and I think uh, budgeting my grass I could probably make it a couple months longer yet if I wanted so you know in the end it was it was hard to to forego the monthly check from the from those yearlings from the custom grazing but it, it was probably the right decision you know just chalk that one up to experience and and that's the the great part about flexibility of seasonal uh, seasonal production and enterprises. Uh, enterprise stacking, you know, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, bringing in more things, more diversity, always helps. And, and I would include direct marketing as as some of that diversity. And then what um, Alan Nation, the editor of Stockland Grass Farmer, always likes to ask is, what is your unfair advantage? Um, I guess I would say what I'm finding for me being right next to the Mississippi, especially on dry years, there is a lot of, um, well, like Neil along Iowa Lake there, he's called it some pretty coarse grasses, slough grass, reeds canary grass. Um, there's an abundance of that and if I could get to that when it's uh, fairly dry in the summer give it a recovery period um, there's a lot of feed there that could get me you know far far into the winter and and it's um, it's easily rented ground there's a lot of labor as far as fence because there is no fence but um, that's my unfair advantage um, Neil has from what I'm seeing, uh, quite a few advantages. Um, being being where he is, well, first of all, Neil, I've checked out you and Laura's blog, and I have to commend you. I think you guys are on a on an excellent uh, on line of thinking and, and direction. Um, I'm, with right. the dairy, it uh, it seems like your dad has things set up really well and, and he seems like a, a really deep thinker too with how he's helping you guys out getting started and and uh, you have a lot of options um, with not only with that with that dairy but but uh, what your dad sounds like he'll allow you to do as far as uh, um, converting things to grass or, or changing the herd or whatever so yeah, um, it's very nice. Let's see. I'm just going to read a few of the comments here, make sure I'm keeping up with things. Um, Aaron Wilson, uh, what did I replace custom grazing income with? Basically, I did not replace it. I forego... Um, the custom grazing for a couple more months so that it would allow me um, grass for my sheep to eat. So in that case it didn't directly make me income but it saved me money in hay expense that I would have had to have been feeding at this point if I put all that grass through the custom grazers. Um, okay. So continuing with those principles for success that I see, the kind of the big four things that have helped me a lot anyway, and, and they may help you guys listening, is holistic management first and foremost. I, I really believe in that. Um, I, not only the goal setting and the decision making, but, uh, but also the, the grazing planning. And, and at the stage, Neil and Laura that 
that you guys are at. There's um, there's also land planning, and uh, you know that would fit so well with uh, with that tract of land around Iowa Lake that you guys are talking about developing. Uh, it's always nice to you know know your goals and and get a piece of land like that set up the first time, so that it uh, you don't have to. Uh, start over or place tanks in a different place or you know like uh, like the story with Greg Judy he went to one of his first grazing seminars and you know he's he's a workaholic so he went home and he started putting in fence from what he learned that day well a few years later he he learned more and he tore it all out and and uh, and put things in a different spot so uh, that land planning is is pretty important too uh, Bud Williams and animal handling, um, you know that that is really really handy. Um, not only in time saving for handling animals, but you will see you know an increase in in animals gaining too, better health. You know all of those things. Um, if anybody goes to Neil Dennis's talks, you know ask him about that. He's he's a big believer and. And really utilizes it, and then also, you know, the study ruminant nutrition. Um, you know, not not necessarily the formal study like you get in college, but the mostly the protein to energy ratio. At least where you know where we are here in Iowa, um, it it really changes throughout the the season. Um, you know, you have what they call really washy grass early on and way high in protein and and you just it it's uh you'll learn how to manage your recovery periods to try to balance that ratio and, and you'll get better performance out of the animals. Um and then diversity, you know, uh all things diversity and that leads toward more sustainability. Um so a little bit more on holistic management. Um, we talked about that there's the setting goals, making decisions, land planning, grazing planning. And then I will mention, as Luke did at the start, um, some of you probably missed it, just signed on, um, that, uh, that there, there's going to be a short course before the conference. And uh, I would highly recommend that. There's a link, and I see Luke put that up to, to the Bud Williams principles, um, and, and again ask Neil about it. And here's a couple of guys I would really recommend. Um, they will describe to you what that diagram on the right side of the screen means. I am still learning it myself, and and I have actually had some ruminant nutrition courses and and still I'm trying to learn it. Um, in college it seems as though I learned quite a bit on how to push a lot of corn through a rumen and not so much on the grass end and uh, corn can really cover up a lot of uh, you know of my mismanagement or, or animal genetic problems or nutritional problems and uh, you have to be, you know, really on the top of your game to uh, to get gain, and especially to finish animals on grass. And the production diversity. Um, one thing I really like about grass-based production is that you can switch between classes of livestock. You know, like we were going just cow-calf before, and then we grazed the yearlings and. We dropped, you know, dropped away from finishing animals at this time. Um, that was, you know, more of a finance uh, type of issue, really, than than anything. But um, as far as you know, having a lot of money tied up in animals for one more year of the finishing period and and feed and everything. But you can switch between all of these enterprises, and you can also go from, you know. Beef cattle to dairy cattle, or sheep or goats, and and uh, you know it it's not all that difficult once you have you know your your permanent uh, fence set up, um, 
and it, that offers you a lot of flexibility with as the market changes and and as your your, your goals change. Um, and I mentioned before marketing diversity. Okay, so now we'll get into I, at at one point here. I asked Neil. Uh, if you'd give me 10 questions to kind of direct how this goes. Um, and so we'll get started on those questions. Structuring my record keeping. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you get involved and <laughs> go ahead and okay. talk as much as you want there, Neil. Okay, yeah, well, once these question slides come up, I'll just ask it right, right off the bat. Okay, great. Um, well, the first question I had was, I'm curious as an overall question of how you structure your red record keeping and how detailed it gets. I guess what we have right now is pretty simple and basic. I am not a huge technology person, so we don't have it on like a, a whole software program. I just, uh, for the heifers we grazed this year, all it was was a one sheet page, you know, income, expenses, and that was it. And it... It was easy and simple, but I have this feeling that pretty soon here we're going to get some into a lot more complicated things, especially with the dairy cows. Yeah, yeah, you you probably will just out of necessity, but you know, I I I like your way of thinking. You know, just keeping it simple first, and and uh, you know, not getting bogged down in too many numbers, and then you know, just kind of turning and absolutely not keeping any numbers so you know simple is is definitely the way to go at first um, you can add more complication and as you add more complication to it 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 becomes you know a lot e you, you'll want to computerize it I would think and and one of the big benefits of computerizing it you know whether it's you know something pre-made and sold or you're doing your own Excel spreadsheets is it, you'll be able to analyze things the numbers in a lot more different ways than just simply your your bottom line what did you net at the end of the year and and one of those yeah. big things would be you know is following a budget and I know from your your blog you guys are you know big on budgeting you know, with household and you know, you know, gas for the car and and things like that. And I think, I think in the end, you'll probably fall right into it that you'll see them, you know, the importance of it and and how it can benefit you. Um, mostly, I just send people on to that last farm and if they want to know more. I I ran on to a really good article um, from one of the writers in Beef Magazine, and I've got that link there. Um, he learned a lot of these things probably through holistic management and ranching for profit and other places that I have and it seems pretty similar and and actually he was he's doing quite a number of, of different things that I wasn't and I'm I'm gonna look at at what I do a lot closer now after reading his article. But uh in short the records that I keep is a daily grazing record uh right alongside the map. Uh, that shows each paddock and the acres in that paddock uh, record it. Uh, stock flow worksheet, basically that's just an inventory of all of your animals, but you can project out, you know, you talked about, you know, you know growing either your grass-based herd or your dairy herd or both. You know, you can, with a computerized stock flow or even on paper, uh, with a pencil, you can uh, project out, um, you know, not only inventory numbers, but you can estimate, um, you know, pay prices, you know, for milk or or pounds of beef or whatever. Um, and then that inventory worksheet, I it kind of all starts with uh, with Quicken or QuickBooks. I use Quicken. Um, and put it into into that, and then onto my Excel spreadsheets. Uh, following a cash flow and budget, this is probably my biggest hurdle: um, is to really get the numbers into the budget and and follow it. And if 
you have a you know shortfall in one area, then you you do some brainstorming and make up for it in another area. Uh, profit and loss statement and balance sheet; those are you know kind of some basic business type uh, forms. Uh, what what sort of weight gain should we be expecting with grass-based livestock? Uh, the I think the first year. So the way we've done it to figure out their weight is um, we have up at the elevator in town here, we just swing over and weigh the trailer full and weigh it empty, and then we do that at the beginning and then at the end. And I think the first year I did not supplement feed, and so um, those steers, I think they gained about 1.1 pounds per day average, and we weren't thrilled with that. And so the second year with the steers, we they gained we, we supplemented five pounds of feed per head per day and they gained two is like two point one pounds I think it was so it was a lot better uh, and then this past year with grazing heifers uh, we bought these heifers or I, we brought them up there at about I think they were three hundred and fifty pounds and then they gained about I think it was one point just under one point five pounds a day and we had talked with a nutritionist that comes to the dairy farm and he was saying for that age of dairy heifers he would expect maybe 1.65 pounds a day so we were a little under that and I, I'm just curious what you got. Yeah, it, uh, you know, it sounds pretty similar. I've had rough years where I've been, you know, t at times during the year um, you know, closer to a pound. Um, I think I averaged 1.3 one year on yearlings, um, and I've been you know one one six to one nine before on good years, and you know trying to really be on top of the management and daily, you know, just taking care of them every little need every day. Um, and of course, it varies throughout the season. Do you supplement feed, Ryan? Um, generally, no, I don't. I've experimented some with um, a product from Mark Bader that's uh, kind of a, I don't know, it isn't really an energy supplement. It's, it's more of a rumen stimulant. Um, it keeps the the biology and the rumen going and, and digesting everything uh, to peak performance and I don't know I mean like like other supplements like that I it's been kind of hit and miss and and it could be you know a little bit just how I carry out the you know the the experiment um, and when we were uh, when we were finishing cattle, um, and we were you know keeping them through a winter hay feeding period, it seems like we'd average a pound and a half a day. Um, you know, pretty pretty much average that for for a number of years. Um, the the numbers for us anyway, I felt like we really needed to be getting two pounds a day average year round to to really make it work now i know there's people out there that are definitely getting that they're they're getting higher than that um but you know some of them are also doing what i'd call more substitution feeding than just supplemental feeding um so the you know they're really like a dairy cow they're really pushing or a high performing dairy cow. I don't know, you know, where you guys are situated, what you how you guys dairy, but you know, some of these real high end dairies, you know, they really push intake so that they get the output and and uh, you know the yeah. same same can go on, on pasture if you really want it to want to do that. Um and so yeah, and so um and so a lot of times we'll see, you know, uh, 50, it'll cost us 50 cents to put on a pound of gain on just grass. And then, like I said, depending on, 
you know, if it's uh, just supplemental feeding or complete substitution feeding, it can be anywhere from a dollar and quarter per pound and up, you know, and so, you know, at a uh, at dollar and a quarter a pound, um, you know, you, you don't have too much margin there, you know, you probably put on gain pretty cheap um, through the summer, but then uh, if, if you're much above that dollar and a quarter, you're going to be eating up, you know, whatever you gain in the summer pretty, pretty quickly. And, and so that's why you, you need to have, you know, some pretty good gains, at least two pounds, I feel. Okay. And I asked what, what's a good aim for profit per cow? And I, well, this year we had a pretty short grazing season that we did. It was really rainy this spring, so we actually didn't get them out on pasture until June 1, so it was pretty late. And we grazed them for four months, and we had plenty of other projects, so we brought them back home at the start of October. So it wasn't very long, and uh, I, I, well, during, the, during that time, we're not exactly sure how to include the costs of our vehicle, since we're driving five miles back and forth each day, and um, I don't know what percent of our car's oil change and such or depreciation we should include. But if we include about $250 for our, our car expenses, I, the way we, what we came out with was we think they made about $67 per head doing it. And we got a question, I think, in a bit about labor, but that's not with labor included. And that was, Neil, that was on your, um, I was, um, sorry, I was reading uh, some of the stuff on the side here, questions I should answer, but that was on your uh, seasonal cattle then by Iowa Lake, you said 60 some dollars a head you made? Yeah, yep, $67. Okay, yeah, I on, on seasonal cattle, that's probably pretty good, you know, and so... You know, and you can see times when, you know, marketing comes into play and, um, you know, if you owned it, you could possibly make more than that. But a lot of times, you know, if you're, if you're doing that on a custom graze, that might be, you know, doing pretty good. And that's where, you know, like any other business volume uh, comes into play. Definitely, you know. Yeah. Yep. Um. Before we go on to the next slide, I'll just answer a couple questions here. Um, yeah, Aaron, you're right. We can look at cow pies to uh, to judge what kind of nutrition and fiber digestion they're getting. Uh, some people say it should look like a uh, little bit looser than pumpkin pie with a little divot in the middle. So, uh, yes, I, I pride myself at looking at uh, poop. My wife laughs at me when my tur I turn my nose up when I do a diaper change on my son, though, and I come home covered in cow poo. <laughs> um, yeah, my folks were on board with uh, which a with HM Holistic Management when we started. They, uh, well, my dad anyway, who I was involved with with the farm, he um, he took the course with us, and so he was very involved. I think. Uh, I think I was in my junior senior year of college, uh, and I came home from school, and I had oh, what was the class? I forget some, some animal science class, and I had just all kinds of questions, you know, going through my head. And he throws this HM book at me. That's I don't know what is it, Aaron? Like six or nine hundred pages you know, very daunting. He throws it at me and he says, just read this and next time you come home we'll we'll talk again, you know. And so he luckily, you know, dad was involved with holistic management and and had aspirations anyway of, of moving the direction that we moved um, even before, you know, I came home and kind of gave the little extra thrust to, to do what we did. Um, okay, we'll go on. Next slide. What are some Reducing. ways you've been able? To... Oh. Uh, Go ahead. How no, have I'm you... sorry. Okay. How have you reduced input costs? Um, I think there's a picture of the fencer we have. I mean, 
our system is very basic, and uh, I, I think we've been able to keep down our costs pretty well. But right now, the areas we're fencing in are sort of odd little spots that are kind of, you know, they're, they're not straightforward and easy to do. So it seems like I've been doing a lot more fencing than I would if it was a more straightforward area. But, um, yeah, other input costs, I'm curious. Yeah, absolutely. I I can completely agree with you on the fencing issue. You know, where I live in northeast Iowa, I don't know if I have a straight fence running more than a couple hundred feet on the whole place. I mean, that's just uh, that's just kind of the nature of it. And and unfortunately, most of the cost in a fence is the posts, which you need a lot more of when you're running corners and things. A lot of corners. Um, and with your earlier statement of adding wires for um, for peace of mind and being able to sleep at night, I can completely agree with that too. That's 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 worth a lot. Just uh, just being able to to sleep at night. Um, so the three big areas, which I mentioned before, you know, our biggest inputs on most places are what we feed the animals, especially what I call. Uh, substitution feeding or hay feeding, uh, land cost and uh, depreciation a lot of times, or possibly um, uh, labor would be another one. Um, so to reduce hay feeding and feed cost, um, I keep all the animals in one mob, or I try to as much as I can. Uh, this will help increase recovery periods and grow more grass which will then extend my grazing season and reduce my hay feeding. Um, I like to vary the stocking rate, as I mentioned, with seasonal enterprises like the custom grazing. That saves grass for the next season um, or a different enterprise. Um, I calve and lamb a little bit later than most people. I like to see at least a month of spring grass growth go into the animals. And one of the benefits of it, doing that anyway is I can actually draw down the cows a little bit more body condition-wise through the winter. Um, they don't have as much body to then maintain and put feed into. And then uh, once that cheap grass first thing in the spring comes and there's always too much of it, the cows will just pack on the weight and they're on a rising plane of nutrition as they calve and then especially as they breed and it all works out pretty well. Um, I use holistic plan grazing to, um, to plan my grazing and, and uh, that, that helps also. And what I've been starting to do is utilize some state and federal ground that's pretty marginal and it is flood prone. So if conditions allow I'll, uh, I'll once in a while use that, and uh, that'll, that'll help me uh, extend my grazing season also. As far as land, I guess this is maybe kind of where, where the labor comes in, too. You know, you want to you wanna be stocked as full as you can. I mean, you, you've learned, Neil, that running five miles down the road to Iowa Lake to move the 15 steers or heifers is, you know, it's fun and it's it's nice, but you're kind of like, oh man, you know, I could be moving 50 of them or, or 100 of them for the, in about the same amount of time that it takes to move the 15. Joel Salatin calls that scalable. That's the great thing about uh, some of these ruminant enterprises is they're scalable. It really doesn't take much longer to fence a paddock or open a gate for, you know, 500 head. And it does 50. Um, grazing management, correct ge cattle genetics um, helps you, allows you to run more animals per acre. Um, that uh, Johann Zietzman from Zimbabwe I mentioned before, he calls his type of grazing non-selective grazing. So the cattle do not have the option of selecting the most prime bite. Um, you're going to be able to run more animals that way, but 
you have to have definitely the, the correct genetics to be able to do it. Most of the genetics we have in the United States would for sure fall apart um, doing, doing that type of mob grazing. And then, of course, letting the livestock do the work. Um, you know, as we've talked about water, you and I, Neil, I, there's, there's a lot of folks out there that really believe in, in letting the livestock walk to water and not setting up a lot of waters in every paddock. I know there's been studies that there, sh there should be no further than like 800 feet to go to water, but there's people out there that, you know, and maybe it has to do with changing genetics, but they're, you know, they're letting their animals walk a long, long ways. I mean, a, a mile plus. Um, so anyway, something to think about. And then depreciation, livestock and equipment. Um, that's the great thing about grass-based enterprises and, and letting the livestock do the work is you can have less equipment. And if you need things done, you know, hire a custom operator. Uh, another uh, great person to Google and, and buy his book is Gordon Hazard, an old-timer from Tennessee. You know, he really believes in that. I, I'm not sure if he's... I'm not sure if he's the one, but he, he definitely believes in it. He's probably just repeated the motto, but you can have uh, every ranch should only have like two hammers and a wheelbarrow, and when times get tough, then you sell one of the hammers, you know. <laughs> that's the only reason why to have two of them. So. But uh, anyway, that's, that's a great part about grass-based farming is, is less equipment, uh, things that rust, rot, and depreciate. Uh, never sell a thin cow, you know, that, with, with the calving and lambing later, that has kind of been working now for me, you know, if, if the cow comes up open and doesn't calve, I actually bring her over the winter because I can winter them cheap enough now. Um, I bring her through the winter, I don't preg test, um, and, and then uh, if she's open in the spring, she's going to pack on a lot of weight in the spring and uh, on that cheap grass and then I can sell them um, you know what I, I have me in June so after June if they haven't calved then I can then I can at least sell a, a fat open cow uh, that put on a lot of cheap weight on spring lush grass and and that you can almost look at that as another seasonal enterprise because then I can destock on those type of animals and then it saves more grass for me um, in the coming months. Um, and then the next thing I'm debating and, and talking with some people with um, is, is breeding all, basically breeding all the heifers and that the, the fellow from uh, Beef Magazine, the writer uh, Burke Tricart He's written about that too. You would find that in his in his blog archives on Beef Magazine's website, and he can explain it a lot better than I can because it's kind of a new idea. But you're you're finding ways to offset the cost of of breeding all the heifers with calling more cows as far as selling bred cows, um, and basically you're just you're ramping up your genetic selection. And you're you're only picking the heifers that are going to calve in the first 21 days, and you're you're finding animals that are adapted just to your management, to your environment, um, a lot quicker. But you need to have feed and land costs under control. That's that's why most people only pick a few heifers, is because we've got so darn much money stuck into them. Um, you know, by the time they drop a calf, that we feel like we need to get you know five, six, seven more calves out of her before she starts turning a profit. And so, um, you know, once the feed and land portions of that scenario fall into place, then, then we can start thinking about that. Um, Luke, uh, before Neil asks this question, how are we doing for time? What, uh, how long should we keep spending at uh, some of these questions? I think I talk too much, so I think you should keep going uh, until you get done with the 10 questions. Okay. I, I'm happy to do that. No problem. Okay, okay Neil. 
how do you go about including labor costs? I kind of said earlier that it's like we that's the profit we made, but I didn't include labor costs, and so I don't you know maybe that's not the profit that I made, you know right, right, yeah, it's that's tough, and when you're starting a new enterprise, you know it's it's kind of a shot in the dark, you know I mean definitely. PFI is a great resource because somebody is probably already doing it, and they can give you at least a you know a little bit of a direction on on what it's going to take for time, and and basically you just got to estimate at first when you're you know think, thinking through whether you're going to make the decision to to go into an enterprise or you know whatever change you're going to make, you got to just estimate first, and if it seems like it looks pretty good, well estimate 20 or 50 percent more time see if it still looks good well if it looks good then then you know jump on it and keep good records and and see if it works out for that first year kind of like you guys did but um, you know I mean I don't want to tell you to keep a log book of every time you drive down to the other farm but you know somehow you gotta you gotta a little bit account for your for your labor and and uh, you know that that'll fall back on your you know quality of life statement too that you'll you develop through holistic management. Did I did that? The... Yeah. Well, did that help at all? Is that too vague or? <laughs> nope. That's interesting. Yeah, it's good to think about. I this year I actually started writing down um, all the time I spent. And then somewhere along the line, I forgot to do it and didn't get back to it until like right at the end. Then I kind of realized that I didn't do it much. So it's like I I started doing that, but it comes back to that detailed record keeping where we haven't quite got it very detailed yet. Oh yeah, yeah. That sound you hear is the sound of my head nodding. You know, <laughs> totally been there, done that. Yeah, you try to you try to keep the good records, but it you know, <laughs> things come up. So, yeah, it's always a work in progress. Uh, in our area, hay costs have skyrocketed. Has it done the same in northeast Iowa? I kind of assume it does, or did. Um, has that changed your winter feeding strategy? Because I, I think I had read somewhere, or maybe you said it to me, that you feed a lot of hay that you buy during the winter and you don't make hay. Yeah, yep, and... And for the most part, we don't, you know, I, we don't own any hay equipment. I do know a couple of guys that will put up hay for me. So, like, once in a while, I'll fall into something on some of this marginal ground where they'll want it hayed rather than than grazed. Or if I cannot get animals there, they'll allow me to hay it or whatever, you know, at a pretty reasonable price for the land. And... I mean, the, these custom guys, they can they can come in there and they can justify, you know, not wanting a lot per bale or per acre because they cover so many acres. So I, I will do that to get some hay around. Um, I This summer I wasn't going to have as much of that land available, so I did go out and find um, there was somebody with some older hay that came a little more reasonable. Um, I know people have said it probably loses some nutrient value, and that probably is true. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's some give and take there. Um, and then changing the cattle genetics, you know, smaller, um, smaller cattle, less maintenance requirements. Um, you know, hopefully they can be a little more fleshed up going into winter. And, and hold their hold that condition a little bit better. That's that's kind of been what I've been trying to do on the genetics end to help that whole thing. And and you know really just just trying really hard to um, graze as far into the winter as I can and, and monitor the the cattle's body condition. Okay. Um. Have you dealt with different breeds of livestock, and has it made a big difference financially? Uh, I guess on the dairy, um, we have 
Holstein Jersey Cross cattle, and we have some Swedish red cattle. Oh, there's a red and white Holstein in the herd. So that we kind of have a somewhat of a variety of genetics, but um, still there is a base of Holstein cattle, and I've heard that they don't do so well with grass, and I'm just curious what you've had. Um, yeah, we, so, yeah, we've tried, you know, some different things with the beef cattle. We, we got into Devon's for a little while and we weren't, uh, we weren't being real good about nipping off the horns and so we didn't like horns and so we got out of Devon's was really the main reason why we did. Otherwise we liked, uh, that cross and, um, otherwise we've just been doing well, we were primarily black kingas. We kind of switched to red a little bit more, and and uh, just trying to go with grass-based type genetics, um, and that's uh, you know that's helped some. Um, and then recently sheep, and I think you know I I've I've heard people tell me that uh, sheep are more profitable than cattle, and I think I'm maybe starting to see it. Um, I know fellows out west will say that there's a lot of cattle ranches out there that were uh, bought and paid for with the income off of their sheep flocks. So um, you know, I think there's something to that with having a you know the smaller whether it's smaller genetic smaller frame animal of that breed or going to you know a completely different you know, thing like sheep or goats, they're even smaller. Yet the 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 maintenance requirements are just a lot less, and and there, I think there's something to that as far as then the leading to profitability with the grass-based enterprise. Uh, well. Land values and consequently land rent in this area have increased dramatically. The land we're grazing is not top quality ground, but it is and some of it has been under tillage and does produce crops well. Um, how might we go about determining rent agreements with Neil's parents? I guess so far for the land we grazed first, my parents were happy to see it grazed and they weren't able to use it. So they allowed us to just rent it for free and then we you know, this year I guess we rented what just just under five acres, and so we're starting to do that. And you know, we paid rent based on the amount of bales that they've been able to graze or to get off of that ground, and that's kind of how we came up with it. But I'm wondering how you've what you think about how we could go about doing that. Yeah, I mean that that seems like a good way to go with. You know, looking at how many tons of hay you could produce off of it, and and figuring up a value that way. Um, you know, I mean, you could you could sure just look at the you know rental rates in the area for similar similar grounds. You know, same soil type and slope and all of that. Um, you know, I I guess I wrote there opportunity cost accounting. You know, if your dad you know, say your dad can rent it out to the neighbor corn and bean farmer, not that he wants to or wants to see the land go for that use, but say you could do that for 300 an acre. Um, you know, we, we've got to ask ourselves, should we really even be, if we, if we can't be, can't pay that and be profitable with grass-based enterprise, you know, should we be doing that? And, and there's, I mean, there, there's a whole whole mess of questions that follow that statement and um, you know I, I guess I'm kinda just gonna say to each their own you know it uh, land prices sure may change here too we, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future and and um, yep. you know everybody's goals come into play too on, on what they want the landscape to to look like and and how do you put a price on that it, it's hard to say but um, you know, I think you and your dad are, you know, on on the right track, definitely with with value, valuing it that way. Um, you know, one thing I will say, 
with these land prices, it, it may, you know, it may come down to doing stacking, you know, crop type enterprises or whatever, you know, with these livestock. Um, you know, that's uh, Gabe Brown. That's that's going to be an interesting talk. I have not heard him live before, and um, I, I did go to Mark Shepherd's field day this summer. That's very interesting. Um, I just can't figure out how he buys cheese trees that cheap, uh, but uh, it's it's really interesting. But uh, you know, adding crops and grazing cover crop, grazing you know crop stubble, things like that. Not always, but you know, on some rotations and having a really diverse rotation, that might be some of what is going to have to happen to have livestock incorporated, you know, in, in some of this high dollar land. I, I wanted to mention too, um, Steve and Nick, uh, Nick Wallace, I think he's near Vinton, Iowa, but he's been doing this for a lot of years and I know he sells grass fed beef and he's got a few other enterprises and, and, uh, and his dad, Steve, is a real seed guru. And I know they've been integrating things like that, and he'd be a good one to, you know, pick his brain on, on how to go about that. But it's a, uh, yeah, I mean that land land price, the way it is on on good tillable ground is is definitely a hurdle. Yeah. Yep. When do you think is a good time to begin buying land instead of renting? Well, I think you and your dad are definitely on the right track with with the way you're doing it. It's pretty similar to how dad and I did it, um, where we just, um, you know, I kind of purchased a, a percentage of the herd every year until I worked up to half ownership. And and then uh, at that point, I, I just... Uh, Basically, we have a contract, and I'm making yearly payments until I get the, the other half um, bought. And it's kind of, you know, I, I guess I see it at, is to get to that point where you own half, and then you'll have, you know, some good cash flow. And then once once you have the contract for the rest of them, um, then you're getting all the cash um, from the herd rather than half. Um, and then you can you can put that either you know depends on how it cash flows you can put that toward you know buying the other half of the herd or if it's you know cash flowing really well which a lot of dairies do you know you can put that toward uh, starting to purchase some land but you know that's not to say you know if you have some opportunities or you know it sounds like you guys really budget well and save well you know maybe you want to put that you know toward land sooner than in that seven-year mark when you own half of them because, I, you know, the way the, the, the way our, our cash is getting devalued, you know, maybe, maybe a person wants, wants to put that into something a little more, you know, substantial like land. Uh, maybe that will, will hold its value a little bit better than, than just cash. Uh, to what extent should we focus on things giving us the greatest financial returns? It seems we could do a bunch of different things, but it might not be profitable enough. Like, you know, adding, we would like to at some point consider adding chickens as part of the rotation on the field, but I think at that point we'd have to be going out there twice a day to let these chickens in and out. And for doing other things too, it's like I could do a whole lot of things, but um, what, how much should I focus on the best returns? Yeah, um, well, I mean, returns are important. That's that's what keeps us all in business. So, yeah, it it definitely is important. And so then you have to, you know, try to try to figure out what what a return would be for your labor on you know the the eggmobile or you know whatever whatever you're doing with the 
the pasture birds and and see if it would come out and and you know there's a little bit of um you know social and environmental um you know informa uh information you have to take in too you know how how does that enterprise fit in those ways um you know, I had wrote here the pasture hens and the egg mobile might not be extremely profitable, but they might disrupt the parasite and fly cycles. They might disperse all the manure pats and help you grow more grass, leading to more whole farm profit. That's that that's really what we're going for here, and and that's a little bit harder to put our our finger on um, when you're looking at individual enterprise you know budgets or you know projecting things um, and then also you know not just environmental and profit wise socially too you, know, you can have eggs for your for your own family or you can give them away to your neighbors or whatever and, and have a better relationship with your neighbors so it's uh you know there's there's a there's a whole ball of things with any one decision and and again that's why I like uh, holistic management you can it helps you work through all of those those little questions, but uh, you know, generally, and you mentioned Joel Solitan, and I will again. You know, he calls it uh, your holonic enterprise. So you wanna generally you you wanna have one main enterprise that you know you know brings brings home the the dollars. And then you can work out from that other ancillary enterprises that, you know, they might not be as profitable, but they might help that main enterprise be be more profitable. And then also I'll mention uh, as you add every enterprise, there's there's a learning curve too. You know, you're going to make mistakes, and and so you got to you know look at that too. Uh, I really like that book Outliers uh, mentioned there at the bottom. Uh, do we want to? I don't know how many more questions there are, but um, Luke, what are you thinking? Yeah, let's. Uh, why don't you keep keep sharing, and and we'll we'll just ask people to share questions if they have in the chat box right now, and and if it takes a, if folks can stay a few more minutes, that's fine. But uh, we'll 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 formally end it in another few minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. This question. Go ahead, Ryan. No, I was just going to mention this was the last question. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're coming up on various limitations to increase the number of cattle being grazed, like water systems. We have a very basic system right now. We're transporting supplemental feed. We've kind of been using the trunk of our car. It's a hatchback car, and then, or time spent building fence. It's getting to be a lot of time. How could we push past some of these obstacles? Yeah, so in the next few slides, I've got some uh, water and fence ideas for you. Um, I, I would really recommend you uh, sit in and listen to Neil Dennis. He's going to have a lot of great time-saving advice for you. Um, he can uh, put up and take down a quarter mile of polywire like nobody's business. He, he has it down to a science, and, and uh, you know, with a few small investments, uh, you know, you could really save a lot of labor and uh, run more animals and make it worthwhile to run to that farm. Um, as far as transporting feed, yeah, I, I mean, I can see that definitely was a good return on your five pounds of grain that you fed. I mean, you, you gained a whole pound per day for the whole season more. So, um, yeah. yeah, if you're just supplementing like that, um, yeah, it, it it takes time, but it there there should be a return there. So, yep. um, yeah. So, so yeah, I talked. To, I guess, I, go ahead. Well, um, this is kind of what it looked like for us. We just had these tubs, and it's um, what we used was a mixture of corn. Uh, it was the the feed that we actually fed the steers at my parents' farm. Um, it's like corn. Distiller's grain, corn silage, it's, it was kind of hot feed, so we definitely didn't let them have more than five pounds a day. And it, it, 
it kind of worked out pretty well, I thought. But eventually, you know, if even if we have just 50 cows, I think we're already going to be hitting the limit of how much feed we can move in our car. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. I I can see that, and and hopefully, you know, you find it profitable to, you know, move up a step. And and that's kind of yeah part of part of scaling up in inter, any enterprise. Yep. Yeah, and so if you're looking at the picture here, um, what we grazed was off to the left side. There's a creek that comes into the south side of the lake. Um, you can kind of see an outline of. It's a little squared off in some spots, but on either side of the creek is what we have grazed. So down further, and um, there's um, also to the there's a little strip of trees off to the left. We fenced that in this year, and then the hill just north of that. So that gives you a visual idea of what we have. Yep, and here you're looking at the creek right where it comes into the lake. Um, mostly this is how we've uh, gotten water to our animals. We used this pump and pumped it out of the creek. But for the last two years, the creek dried up partway through the summer, so we had to start transporting water back in, well, to the, to the pasture from Harris. So it was, we used a 500-gallon tank, and it got to be more time involved, and it wasn't very fun. Yeah, there's the tank. So, um, so a couple ideas I came up with, and I put this slide together after I read your blog about your uh, grandpa, you know, having his cattle swimming in Iowa Lake, and the neighbors weren't too happy. And so, this maybe completely does not work for your environmental desires. But, you know, you could have um, fabric running through some of that marshier ground um, stabilization fabric then on into the water and then you lay down rock and then basically what you're seeing there is a floating electric fence and it controls the area where they are and you make it the appropriate size that they'll stay they'll get their drink but then they'll want to leave before they uh, you know stand there and and defecate in the water and and cool off for for a couple hours um, here's out at Chad Peterson's ranch where I was this summer visiting. Um, he does like you with the uh, with the pump, but he runs it con continuously, day and night, all the time. Um, they figured out you'd think it would be a lot of gas, but they figured out it cost one cent per head per day um, to do that. Um, here's a couple other ideas if you're running off of a well. I do really like well water. It seems like it definitely is the best animal performance wise uh, having that clean water. Um, temporary movable tanks or a permanent tank. I believe Neil Dennis has like one permanent tank and his cattle walk back to it like a mile. So he doesn't have like a huge investment for the you know 800 or a thousand head that he grazes every year with just one tank. Um, and then Fence, uh, you know, it, it's an investment we all need. You talked about that, adding wires. You know, you're probably working towards something that, like on the picture on the right uh, with the multi-strand electric. You know, maybe you want to save up for, you know, it's a 736-24 netting. It's a 7-inch vertical gap, 36 inches tall, and 24-inch horizontal gap. And it's great for goats. They can get their horns back out. But then you're ready for about any type of livestock you want to graze. You'd only do that on the on the perimeters. Um, there's your solar fencer. Yeah, this is how we've been charging our area. Uh, it it's been a nice solar fencer, but uh, I I'm still not happy with the amount of charge that it puts out, and it, it keeps cattle in. But there are times when Especially if too much grass is touching the bottom wire, I get a little concerned about it. And there's our our pasture is not too close to an electric source other than this. <laughs> so we've made it work. 
Yeah, uh, that's the Energizer is definitely something along with the ground rods that go with it that you uh, you don't want to scrimp on for sure, especially if you're you're near a highway or or crop fields. Um, here's one of the things Neil Dennis runs, and I bought a number of them from him too, and it, they work well as a bat latch. So um, say say you're going out and visiting your, your heifers today, but you can't make it tomorrow because you're going to be running the silage truck all day. Well, you could set up a, an automatic opening gate, and if you have them trained to it, they'll move on to the next uh, paddock by themselves the next day. Um, and then tumble wheels is something I'm just now trying um, this winter. You don't have to put in a permanent post um, besides for the two ends. And it just kind of rolls along. You can move it forward and you aren't pounding posts into the frozen ground. And it, it works well in the summer too, evidently. Um, so, Neil, this is kind of... You know, just a little idea anyway. It, it's maybe way off base, but, you know, I mentioned to you this house site. You never know what you could come up with for an agreement. You know, slap a water meter on the guy's well, and you could have a tank site set right there near uh, the south, the, the bottom side of this picture. Or you could water out of the lake, whether you're pumping it or, like uh, Luke mentioned, using a nose pump. Uh, to get it away from the lake or if they're going directly into the lake to drink and you could lay out paddocks you know so all you have is your perimeter fence that's permanent and then this red fence that's the alley is also permanent like single strand high tensile and then running off of it the white and green lines are temporary wires um, that you put up and you may want an ATV for that you might have to invest in that, but um, you don't have a lot of permanent infrastructure involved there. And then the cattle are just, you know, going out of that paddock and then walking to water. And I think I measured it on on Google Earth, and it was, you know, they're really not going to be walking all that far. It, it should be a manageable length. Huh. Just an idea anyway, I mean that, uh, you know, go visit with your local NRCS staff. They've got all kinds of calculators and could come up with ideas for you too. But, uh, you know, generally with this, you know, fencing and paddock layout stuff, if there's a will, there's a way. So, all right. I think what we'll do is we'll end here, uh, Ryan, and then we'll put this whole PowerPoint on our website with this recorded farminar. And uh, it sounds like we'll just have to keep doing great grazing farminars because there's so many things to talk about. Okay. Sounds, yeah. sounds great, Luke. Um, here's some other final links. And uh, if you'll allow me to, Luke, I will just mention to everybody listening that I'm, uh, I am applying for the Labor for okay. Learning. Um, to right. be a men mentor, and if I get accepted, and anybody listening, or if anybody knows anybody um, that would like to work, and and you think what I presented here looks all right, I will do my best to uh, to teach that person uh, everything I I do know, and um, which isn't near enough, but. Uh, but we're all learning. Ryan, you're going to be chasing away all the applicants with a stick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, well, we'll see. Well, thanks, all, everyone, for watching. And uh, join us next week for the last of the fall farminars. And we'll continue more farminars in the winter. Stay tuned for a press release on that probably in another couple weeks. Thanks, Luke.